He paid for all of the sins, for all of the people, for all of time. You know, it doesn't take a double doctoral or a master's work. I'm not poking fun at anybody. Be who God created you to be, please. It always boils down to our relationship with Jesus. That, it, that relationship affects everything in our lives. God chose Israel. Our founding fathers chose God. Be a doer of the word. Because faith without works is dead, for real. That's religion, that's knowledge, that's intellect. You need to go out there and engage with your world and own your liberty. That was powerful. I agree with everything except the color purple, but besides that, it's just not my favorite, but I'm going along with everything else. So we're going to do something at the end, and I'm going to add to something, and it's going to kind of see if I need some liberty today. Is that all right? Yeah. Our house is I have been up since three, weighty, in a good way, over you guys. And every conversation I've had, from my brief encounter with you to my brief encounter with Craig to our conversation last night, I feel like I'm the one being ministered to because it's like, oh, I got to talk about that today. Oh, wow. Let's, it just kept coming in. So I believe my, my job today is to be a, I'm not a good conductor because I'm not even good at music because I can't keep a rhythm. So you're going to have to go with that, is to conduct all the things that happened this morning because not each thing is separate. It's all today. And in prayer, God it wants to do something that you don't walk away with more information. We're going to give an opportunity for God's spirit to move in a way that you may have never experienced before. And you can, I can attest to this. My family knows. I don't make declarations like this. I'm just saying God wants to do something and he's not, we're not going until he does. Okay? You'll still eat. Don't worry. You'll get there but he wants to do something. And we're gonna talk through several different things to get there. But I'm gonna say this. Um, when it comes to your offering for us, I want you to give the deepest that you've ever given before. I know Steve's going, what in the world are you doing? I want you to catch the heart of the Father to such a degree that we can go further and everything that is talked about today will make sense. Oh, I know, Brian, you're doing an offering. I don't do offerings because at the end of this service, all of that offering is going to Stephen Kay for them to take the ministers that need it to go on a trip to be ministered to. And that's what we want to do because we're in this together. We're not in this separate. I can't stand and say, I walk with you, brother, and hand me a check. We're in this together. We're in this together. And I hate, I know you hate taking my money. You hate it <laughs> with every fiber of your being, and he will fight with me. You, I'm publicly telling you, he has to take it, all right? <laughs> but you guys are my family. That I want to undo. We're not doing fatherlessness and Steve Castle's working with people in purple chairs, okay? It is not less. It's okay if you like purple. I, I just, it's not my favorite, but it's the same. Because of this, we're doing this, and because of this, you share in it. So when I say give, I want you to remove something, because I think by the end of this service, something will unfold. But we need to, as a body, minister to the, be the people serving. And you're like, okay, but, you know, what about me? Get over you for a moment. We'll get there. We'll get to you. So today is about you. All right, that was kind of heavy. We travel a lot. And my, my son's not going to like this story, but it's for him. We travel a lot. And there's places that you belong and places you don't belong and places for things for you and places things not for you. And in the travel, when you get on an airplane, you know, you get your seat, you have your overhead bin, 
But a lot of people don't fully understand what the overhead bin is for. In our current world, they think it's the two pieces of luggage that they're saving money on to shove in the overhead bin. It's not for that. And a little while back, someone just lost their mind of what the overhead bin was for. And they decided to put their dog in the carrier in the overhead bin. <laughs> well, guess what happened when the plane landed? The dog ate, ain't alive anymore, not too happy. They killed the dog by putting it in the overhead bin. Now, how long does it take people to understand the purpose of things? Everyone knows the overhead bin is made for cats. <laughs> now, okay, forgive me, cat lovers. I will put your address up so everyone can send the cats to you. No, cats are fine. I wanted to lighten it up just a little bit. We're getting a little, because it, it, I, I feel weighty today. So that was, that was for me, so thanks for laughing. Cats are fine, everybody. Cats are fine. So, in, I have three rivers that are gonna feed into a main river. And so each one of those rivers is gonna have something for you. And we are talking about fatherless because God wants to father us. The imagery of this is so important of the role of a father. Part of the challenge is we don't really know what a father looks like. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a little mercy on fathers because we have no good real example of what a father looks like. I look through scripture of fathers. I've looked through scriptures of the godlike marriage. I've looked through scriptures of how to raise your kids. It tells you how to do it, but I haven't found an example of it yet. Because Jesus wants to be the example. So he wants to show what a father and a child relationship looks like. And so in this pursuit, there's going to be a little bit of weight. Now, we're grace people here, right? We're not superficial grace. We're not the grace that says we could do whatever we want. We, we believe in the deep grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly lusts, but to leave a self-controlled, upright, and godly life. Now, I know we're going, oh, great. So here comes the heavy. We got to be this thing. I'm good when we're done. You can't be it. You need to see it. You need to experience it. It has to come from you. It, it can't just be put on. And we're going to unpack this. And I have three different, three different streams that need to come in to make this all work. And I'm going to begin with first, uh, Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. Thought we'd read the Bible today a little bit. And I, I want this, there's two, two epistles. One last year really affected me. And over this, this current year, so the year before, this current year, Second Peter affected me in a whole different way. And I'll, I'll be honest, I, I, I like Peter, but Pete didn't really do it for me because he's kind of heavy. He kind of has a, a way of saying things. It's like, well, wait a second, I'm... I already have that. Now you're telling me to do something and you're, you're putting this weight on me and I, I, can't, I can't do that. But I want you to catch Peter's heart because in a way, he was, he, he's not what we build the church on. So, so getting his bones and laying it down and building a structure on top of Peter is not what Jesus meant. We know it's the revelation from the spirit of God out of him of seeing who Jesus was is what the church is built on. But there's still an application because God does things with people, through people, and that's how it works because we're his body, right? So we, we can't just wait for the head to go and he says, move the arm. It's like, well, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to get in the way. Well, you're in the way because you're not be doing what the head is having you to do. That's the body working. 
So when you do in, go in line with what the Father is telling you to do, you're acting on his behalf. And so what people see is Jesus. Because he sees the body. Simon Peter is about ready to die. He says, I'm about ready to be put off. And the prophecy that the Lord spoke to me that you won't control yourself in the end. In other words, the type of death that he would experience. So he's preparing to be martyred. This is all done. He already knows this is coming. I want you just to just imagine just for a moment. You're carrying the weight and in Let's say we don't know the time frame. In one month, they're going to they're gonna martyr you. They're going to put you on a cross, hang you upside down. and Well, you choose to be upside down so you don't relate according to historians. But either way, they're going to put you on a cross and kill you. And, and Peter's writing, more concerned about us than himself. Because that's what happens when you discover what you really are. So Peter, in pure love, has a weight. And I can almost feel the tears at times with Peter. He has this weight for the body. And I'm coming into such a great environment here because we share the same. We've walked through years. I mean, how many years have we been coming? We've been sharing the same DNA, the same word. We've been walking in the same path. We're on the same page together. I'm not talking to a group of people that may be interested in God, may not be interested in God, kind of have some ideas about Christianity, just want to feel good. You, you won't feel good here, I mean, just in the flesh. <laughs> Unless Kay's talking, right? You're not going to feel good. I, but it's not a hurtful, it's not, it's bettering. And Peter has this weight on the church, and he has a concern, and he, he writes... In, in verse 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I love how he starts out, a bondservant. I chose to enslave myself to Jesus. In all his freedom, in all the liberty that he understood, he chose to enslave himself and be an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained like precious faith. So he's not talking to the world. He's not talking to a layout of sin. It's not like a speaking to the first Corinthian church by Paul where it's like, I got to deal with a lot of issues here. You guys have issues. So this isn't a cleaning house of all your problems. This is those that are sharing this like precious faith. And as a father, he is speaking to his children. He said, grace and peace. Remember those two words. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. Multiplied. I love it. He said, don't be added. Multiplied to you. Right? That means they already had grace. They already were walking in peace. And Paul, Peter is saying, I want this multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. So how does grace and peace get multiplied? In the knowledge of him. There's no other way to get it. There's, there's no, and it's not learning about him. Don't get me wrong. I'm going I'm to quote someone that teaches about, but learning about Jesus doesn't make you better. Won't increase your grace. Won't increase your peace. It's what you hear. Choose to go in, digest it, let it become a part of you and become a living knowledge increases your grace and peace. We are only trying to get you to love what's here. At the end of the day, that's our whole objective. That's the why. We're not trying to get more followers. We're not trying to get more clicks. We're not trying to get more likes. We're not, we're not doing any of those things. It's only one purpose for you to see what you really are. And we sang about it. We talked about it. Be multiplied to you in the knowledge. But this is going to be really hard to do. I have like eight sermons in my heart. And, <laughs> and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power, listen, listen to this. I'm going to read this again. I want you to listen closely. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord as his divine power. Is there anything more powerful? As his divine power has given us, if you're reading, what does the next verse? Things. 
that pertain to life and godliness. There is nothing that you need that he has not already provided. All we need is knowledge and experience of who he is as a father teaching his children and something begins to happen because things begin increasing on the inside of you. Has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. How is it obtained? Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Later on, Peter says, we knew Jesus was the fulfillment of the scripture when we heard the words. He heard them twice. The first time he heard these words, when John the Baptist went to go baptize Jesus and they heard a voice from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. What's Peter doing? He's comparing the two. He has come to you and said, you are my beloved child in whom I'm well pleased. That's his glory and virtue. You're going to have to get this because I'm going to just unload a lot of stuff here. So you just, who called us by glory and virtue? By which we've been given, we got a gift, exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Think about that. Having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. Peter is not saying something you can't have. He is not teaching about something that we aspire to. He's teaching you something that you already have. But we've not been fought, let God father us in how to activate what's already been given to us. <coughs> I'm going to pause there for a moment on Peter. Because I'm going to switch now to a little different gear. Is our founding fathers. Founding fathers understood something. Now here's the deal. They weren't walking in the identity but they knew the virtue, the, the thing that would change everything is if we knew what we were. In fact, later on, Peter goes to, in uh, verse 5, but ye also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And when you listen to this, don't think, okay, I first got to get faith, then I got to get virtue, then I got to get self, you know, Knowledge. Okay, great. Okay, got the knowledge thing done. And we do this checklist. That's, that's information up here. What he's saying is, you're of like precious faith. Now add to that these things. And if we add knowledge, which the word is gnosis, it's, you, you correct me, Steve. I'm not, I'm just going to try. It's a Greek word. It means experiential knowledge, wisdom, understanding, how to work with it. You've been in it. It's, it's a part of you, that knowledge. Self-control. Ooh, ouch. To self-control, perseverance. Well, if I had self-control, I'd be a whole lot different than I am today. That, that went through someone's mind. But it's a gift. Don't worry. Don't worry. Perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. To brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours, which they are, if these things are yours, then you will abound and abound. You will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. What is Peter telling us? Some have been saved. They believe in Jesus. They're waiting for the return. They're eager for it. But they're so focused on one little aspect of who Jesus is that they slowly become blinded to everything else that is around them. And pretty soon you become disenfranchised 
Because this little thing that you're focusing on is not coming to pass in the manner that you would want it to come to pass. And you're frustrated. Am, am I speaking to anybody here? Okay, I'm speaking to myself, right? We're frustrated that God, you promised him, and it's not coming to pass. We're, sh we're short-sighted. We're, we're right here. And what God is saying, I need you to step backwards. Understand these other things that I've given to you so you can see. This is why Peter wasn't like, oh, I just can't wait till Jesus comes. Oh, I can't wait till Jesus comes. I just can't wait till Jesus comes. Dear Lord, look how bad it is. Jesus must be coming. And we create theologies and doctrines and everything to deal with. I hope you're getting me out of this problem. Short-sighted. And then we become itchy in our ears. And Peter's warning. There'll be teachers that will prey on your covetousness. Your desire to know something more to solve the problem of your short-sightedness. And then guess what you only see? What goes through that lens. And pretty soon, you're sharing videos and texts and different things that support your vision. In the meantime, you've completely forgotten who you become. But if we step back, we can put all that into perspective. We can understand. So now I'm going to tell you what the founding fathers said. We want to, okay, now I'm going to go back to a national thing, all right? So if you're not from America, it's fine. But there's a principle here because we have a founding document when the founders wrote the Declaration of Independence. They believed that all men were created equal. And we've been given inalienable, inalienable rights from our Creator life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the piece that I want you to walk away from is we're going to learn something about the pursuit of happiness. Because the founders wanted it, God wants it, and I'm sure you want it. But guess what? We're going to have to undo this lens so we can understand what were they pursuing. Were they pursuing feeling good? Was they pursuing, hey, maybe something bigger? A new car. Man, if I just had, then I could get this. And this pursuit, that has been a lie since Satan was in the garden and deceived woman and man partook and the sin came in. God is holding out on you. If you only had this, then you could be. You think he's changed his marketing tactics? It still works. We buy all this stuff because, man, if I had that, then I'd be something. Right? Get a guy who loves fishing, but not very good at catching them. He'll have all the gear. Because if he only had that one more lure, or only had that one more pull, or you just get someone who knows how to catch fish, like our guys in Thailand, they just grab an old rotted old net and throw it in there. Next thing you know, they got fish for dinner. They don't care what the lure looks like. They're getting fish. They know how. They understand. They know what's going on. It's not a sport to them. But we made the pursuit of happiness almost a sport. Man, if I could just get to this place, then I can have. Now, some of you are saying, Brian, you're really shattering my dreams this morning. And <laughs> I've already have the lure in my shopping cart on Amazon. <laughs> I can't help you there. I'm just saying. It'll make you feel good. But God doesn't want you to feel good. He wants to do something far greater. He wants you to be good. Oh, but Brian, how are you coming up with that? Well, let's, let's look at our founding fathers who wrote this. John Adams says this. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. I want you to hear what they were founding. They weren't founding an idea of man, this is our land, the, the Brits, I'm tired of their tea, I'd rather have coffee. Man, they're imposing their will on mine. Let's get rid of them. I want to have the coffee the way I want it and I'm tired of tea. That's how we've become. I'll be honest with you. 
Our nation doesn't vote morals. They vote the financial pocketbook of which one's going to benefit them. All sides. There's no moral conviction. There's no, there's no essence of why they're doing it. I'm not talking about a few. I'm just saying John Adams warned about this. Well, that's only John Adams. How about George Washington? Virtue, right? Add to your faith. Virtue. Virtue and morality is a necessary spring of popular government. Here, here's what I'm saying. I'm not here to make a case politically. This, I, if, if you listen to me long enough, I'm not. I'm trying to make a, a case of the, more, the, the heart that Peter was trying to infuse into them as they stand in their faith with Jesus Christ. I want to show you the true heart of happiness is being what you are because it changes everything around them. The founding fathers had a glimpse of this and they knew this. I'm not saying they did it all right. Thomas Jefferson, no government can continue good but under the people's control. And their minds are to be informed by education. Catch the heart of this. What is right and what is wrong. To be encouraged in virtuous habits and deterred from vice. The University of Virginia was founded by Thomas Jefferson to teach morality, ethics, abstinence, freedom from vice, so that they could govern the nation. Because we live in a self-governing place. Peter was saying, you govern yourself. And I'm trying to give you the tools to govern your life that you're not pulled by all the deceit and the lack. And you're, you're looking around, well, I'm lacking this, I'm lacking that. What did he say? You already have it. So if we already have it, rather than going to find the thing that's going to help us be better, we come back to the Father and say, show me how to walk in that. James Madison, to suppose any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without virtue in the people is a chimerical idea or pointless. That's powerful. It's pointless to have a government when the people are not virtuous. Well, you can have one. It's called tyranny. But to be self-governed, to make decisions, to interact with your brother, to, to choose right and wrong, to be willing to have a man. There's, a, there's an era where a man's word meant something. There's no contracts. There's no legal lawsuits. Well, you had a few feuding in Kentucky. But it was based on honor. Their word meant something. Benjamin and Franklin, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. It's so interesting. They're echoing stuff. See, I don't need to go to this to show what the Bible's saying. I'm going to Peter, but I'm trying to give you a picture of how it fits into our daily life. And Patrick Henry said this, a vitiated state of morals, which means out of control, a corrupted public conscience is incapable with freedom. They didn't start a nation because they wanted to market better. They had an idea of a people. Now, I'm going to give you the last words because they're, they're standing. They're, they're putting their life on the line. Peter put his life, and I'm not comparing the two. I'm trying to catch these perspectives because they're spiritual truths that sometimes we go, right? Jesus is here, right? Hey, God loves me, da, 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 da. Now I got real life. I'm trying to put the two into real life of how life was done when you put the principles in together. So the founding fathers at the end of the declarations wrote this. I was just so impacted by it. It was the first time I'd ever read it, to be honest with you. I mean, I read it, but it's like it didn't connect. But as I was meditating on what Peter was emphasizing, I want you to catch the emphasis of the founding fathers. And for the support of the Declaration, this is the last sentences. And for the support of the Declaration, with a firm reliance 
on the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. It wasn't just what they want. They didn't want to feel good. They wanted a nation that was good. And it was going to cost them everything to stand in the freedom. Peter's saying this, it's all been given to you. Man, you got this freedom. Yeah, I'm going to die. I'm, I've already pledged my life to it. In fact, I kind of wish I was John at some point. You know, he gets to live forever. That's Jesus willing. I get to go be hung on a cross. No, it, it didn't matter. Because the principle of what Jesus did was more important than what we get from it. Now you're saying, oh, Brian, then how am I supposed to believe? All right, let's turn over to Judges. I know you never heard the story before, and I probably have never talked about it. We'll do it anyway. Judges chapter 6. And it's Gideon. They're in a horrible situation because the Midianites... You can put any Midianite. You could put, I think the Midianites could be bureaucracy. The Midianites could be anything that takes what you have labored at and snips at it and takes and takes. And every time you pour yourself out, it just comes and takes. That's how the enemy works. We find Gideon behind a wine press, as you know. And I'm going to just tell you this. Gideon came from the tribe of Manasseh. The tribe of Manasseh, him and his brother, got a different kind of blessing than the other brothers because they weren't born of Jacob. They were born of Joseph. And when, jo when Jacob blessed them, of course, he switched hands. Ephraim got the better deal. They'll, they'll catch on later. But Manasseh gets to be adopted in as Jacob's sons. They weren't Joseph's sons. They were Jacob's sons. They became something different. See, God didn't go just find a random person that had no competence, scared, playing video games in the corner, and show up, hey, mighty man of valor. <laughs> well, he was the coward guy. Let me ask you a question. If you're working your field for the farmers here, and an enemy was coming in, and taking everything, and if you stood up against them, they would kill you, but you still managed to take care of your family, sneak behind a wide press, because I'm still gonna feed them. That's not too cowardly. I don't see any of the other brothers doing it. Second thing, he comes in, but he has these questions. Now, I'm only putting that because God has blessed us, and we don't recognize the blessing. So he's not speaking to an unblessed people. He's coming to someone who's already blessed. He's coming to someone at one point believed and may not be believing now. He's coming to not a stranger. He's coming to his own and calling out what he actually is. All right? Of course, Gideon has the same arguments that sometimes we do when God speaks to us. And he said, uh, and, sorry, my page flip, Judges chapter 6, and verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, and I want you to catch, this is what a good father does, because I can tell my son several things to go do, and I already know, I don't know why I wasted those words, because he's going to do something else or think something else until he comes to the end of himself and finally comes back and say, okay, how do I do it? Right? My, my son would say, or until my dad figures out what the real reality is. The Lord is with you. You might, listen to what he's saying. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Okay? Then he says, Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, if God is, if the Lord is with us, isn't it interesting how we shift the blame on everything else? Well, if you're with me, us... Why did all these happen to these people I love and the people I'm connected to and all of this stuff? See, you're not really with us. And he doesn't say that. 
You mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. Very specific. It didn't mean that he didn't want to be with the other people. But he had to find someone who will let him be. So he has the excuse. And then he says, Well, where are all these miracles which the fathers tell us about? Which our fathers tell us about? Saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us in the hand of the Philistines. See, his circumstances was defining his identity. I'm on my own. I'm just going to figure it out. I'll go behind the wine press. It is what it is. Then the Lord turned to him and said, I love that. Then the Lord turned to him and said, You see, sometimes he just lets you talk. But he doesn't leave. He don't leave. But he'll let you yammer as long as you want to go. And then when you're done, he turns to you. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in, this, go in the might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Whose might did he go in? Did all of a sudden he go in? He, he didn't, each character has a little different picture. He didn't go like Samson. Samson was given might. Gideon was given no might. God says, go with your might. Wait a second. I can't do that. Are you saying, is, is that angel saying to Gideon that what he has in him is enough with God to go do what I'm asking you to go do? Is that what you're saying? That's what he's saying. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to give you some superpowers. There's a special suit. Grab that suit. That'll work. And then when you change into the suit, then I'll go be with you and do it. No. And so then he says, so he said to him, my Lord. Now, now he's changing his tune. My Lord. How can I save Israel? Right? And then now it becomes personal. All right. I've kind of gotten over the excuses. How can I save Israel? Indeed. Now, now we come up with all the personal reasons. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. I am not qualified for this. What you're asking me to do, I am the last of the tribes blessed. I am in my father's clan, we're the smallest of the tribe of Manasseh, and I am not well favored in the family. Indeed, my clan is weakest. And in, in verse 16, and the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you. Surely. Truly, how much more do I have to emphasize if you take my promises and you take what I've given and you stand firm in the wholeness of what you've done in me, I am with you, now go. I'm with you. And the Lord said to him, surely I'll be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, grace, same, it's the same, if I found this favor of God in your sight, then show me a sign that is you who talk to me. See, we don't need a sign. We now have the word of God. There's a context to the signs. Don't do the fleece thing. That's how the priests operated their, 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 their garment. Yes, no, that's why it's always yes or no, like the little eight ball. Yes, no, yes, no. That's why you always had these weird questions they asked. Like, I would ask a better question. It was just yes, no. So we don't need a fleece because Peter already said, I've already given it to you. Peter already said, I've given you all the promises. Peter already said, I've completed you. Peter already said, everything's been given to you. And Peter is speaking to us on a man that's about ready to die who witnessed who Jesus was and is now passing that on. So we don't need more. Yet we could go read Paul. We could go read uh, the Gospels. We could even go through the Old Testament and find out that you're still complete. But we're just going to stay with Peter for a moment. 
So of course he gets up and goes. But the first thing God asks him to go do is to go face his father. Isn't it interesting? God wants us to father us, yet the first action he tells Gideon to do is go face his father. But it wasn't a rejection of his father. It wasn't a push on his father. It wasn't a rebellion to his father. He had to go face the beliefs that had been passed down through his family. Sorry, I jumped ahead just a hair. He's going to go do that. But in order for him to go face the beliefs, he has to be complete. When these words came, the angel of the Lord, his first thing he does is he goes and gets an offering of bread and oil. Now I want you to catch this. What is the enemy robbing? Their means to eat. Now he's going to go and get the labor he just did behind the wine press and offer it because he saw something better. He saw something better. Oh, you'll see it in just a second. He saw something better. This is what I am. God is with me. Here, let me offer you a sacrifice. Angel touches it, flames shoot up, and all of a sudden he goes, wow, God's here. He's just listening to the messenger. He has not experienced God yet till that moment. He knows the messengers from God, just like Peter. And I pray today that we walk away, God said. Not Peter said, which is Bible. Not what Brian said, not what Steve said. God said in this. And he goes, behold. And he thought he was gonna get killed because he just saw an angel of the Lord. And then God speaks to him. Oh, this is so powerful. Listen to what God says to him. In verse 21, Then the angel of the Lord put out an end of the staff that was in his hand, and he touched the meat and the unleavened bread. And the fire rose out of the rock. Oh, I'm Peter on the rock. Boy, it's kind of, that's kind of, I'm adding something. I don't want to be over spiritual, but... He is called the rock, and there's a lot of fire there. And consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived. Gideon perceived. Wow, I, I've been focusing on just surviving. I've been focusing on trying to be what I could in this lowlier position. I've, I've tried to find myself in the midst of all the circumstances and just making the best of it. And all of a sudden, he perceived. It opened. <coughs> he perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord, I love this, and the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Wholeness, completeness, all the lies that you have spoken about yourself that isn't what I've said, restore to your rightful position peace. Obviously didn't mean absent from war because he's going to go to war. But he had to become whole so he could lead a nation. He had to become, and we would call that becoming, the word virtue, ladies, this is, a, this is not necessarily your term, but it applies. Manly. Stand up like a man. He was able to stand up in the strength of his identity, his role, his position, whole. And God was with him. And favor, favor and peace. God's with me, God's called me, God's spoken to me, God values me, God chooses me, and now I have his peace. I am whole. 
I am complete, nothing missing, nothing broken, complete, whole in him. And my understanding of what I've become in him increases as I get to know my father. Oh, this is just too much. So Gideon, uh, sorry, I got too excited. I, got, I lost my place. Uh, where was I? 23. 23. All right. It's nice to have a gem in your, I like to be considered a solid gold pillar, but if there's no gem on the top, it just doesn't really sparkle. Then the Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there and called it, the Lord is peace. Why is it important? Because this is the first time God revealed in his nature Right? We get to partake of his divine nature, what peace was. We get to partake. And think about all the conversations he had in his cell. He wrestled with them. Now we fast forward, he has to go face his father. And he tears down the idols, does it at night with 30 of his men. He's led before, he has servants. It's not like he's all by himself as just a kid, he's leading. He just didn't know how to lead. He didn't know where to lead. He didn't know what to lead. So he leads 30 of his servants, and they go at night because you don't want to bother the family. It's a good time. Everybody's in bed. And they tear down the altar, and they take a bull. God said, take this seven-year-old bull. They've been uh, captured for seven years, oppressed by the Midianites for seven years. The family thought it would be a good idea. It's like, hey, we're going to be impressed. We might as well just take something that can make us food. At least we can produce more offspring. And we got the bull instead. God said, I want you to go kill that bull. The thing that you brought into the place that's impoverished you. God is saying, let that go so I can take you to another place. Tears it down. His loving family, right? Brotherly kindness. What they decided to do with uh, Gideon is they came to give them the plan. They're just going to kill him for tearing down the altars, right? The moment you tear down something sacred that's causing us harm, someone is going to get mad. Right? Every time. Every time something sacred to someone that you know is not truth and you find a way to tear it down, they're going to want to kill you. And if not, at least comment on your post. <laughs> They'll do it from a distance so they don't have to get their hands dirty. So now we have this point where it's tore down and his father, I want you to catch this. The healing of the natural father when God becomes a father becomes such a powerful, powerful thing. When Gideon tore it down and the brothers and the sisters and everybody wanted to kill Gideon, his father stepped in and said no. Because his father wanted this too, but he had gotten lost in who he was and he didn't know how to bring it out to Gideon. So what God did is he did for Gideon what his father meant to do for him. Whether it's his competence, I'm not good, I'm not a good provider, I've done these things wrong, and we just kind of mi milk toast around life because we just don't know what to be now. And of course, I don't have a good reputation, so I might as well just keep doing what I'm doing. And it caused boldness to stand in his father's heart. And he said, if any of you touch Gideon, I'll kill you. Let Baal deal with Gideon. Let the gods of this world deal with Gideon. If they want him dead, let them kill him, but you're not touching him. Oh, this is, why don't you catch this? He wasn't abandoning Gideon. He saw what Gideon was. Now I want you to catch this. When you know what you are, and God knows what you are. The enemy also knows what you are. The problem is we don't know how much the enemy shakes at you becoming what you are. You have no idea. Oh, Brian, come on, you're just saying nice things. When they went into Jericho, and Rahab came out and saved them, why'd she save them? Because we feared Everyone is trembling because we fear the God that's with you. 
Why do you think his own people of, of the, the promise wanted to kill Joshua and Caleb? Because they gave a truth that we can take this land. But they were more afraid about their identity and the lies that they've absorbed that they couldn't see. So let's kill Joshua and Caleb for giving a good report. They want to kill them. You guys understand that? Like the moment someone tries to take you into true freedom, they want to kill you. Why do you think the founding fathers pledged their life, their honor, and their fortunes to see this through? Because they knew it would cost them everything. This declaration would cost everything for our people that are coming after us. They didn't even do it for themselves. In fact, many of the founding fathers died in poverty, sacrificing to fund the war to get Britain out of the way and to raise virtue in the land. Okay. A couple more points here. You guys okay? Yeah. All right, okay. What did the Midianites steal? A little bit of bread, the grain the cattle, the food. And each person was there hiding in the, in the crags and the rocks trying to get just a little bit so they don't die. Right? I, I think there's a truth in this. I, I won't say anything. But there's a... Anyway, I'm not going to do it. We're trying to store these crags of the enemy that has been robbing from us. And how do we get a little bit of this? How do we get a little bit of that? Man, if I could just have some of this. See, that's how the enemy has gotten into a lie that you're not what you think you are. So I'm just going to give you scraps and I own you. Oh, my goodness. So now, Gideon goes and picks his men. By the way, read Deuteronomy chapter 20 if you want to understand why he picked his men. God did not randomly just pick men. Ah, take this amount. I want to prove I'm strong. God didn't need to prove he was strong. He was already strong. But there was an order to battle that is in Deuteronomy 20 that lays out what needs to happen for them to go to battle. First of all, you send the fearful home because it says that will become contagious among the men. So those that are afraid, you send home. Those that have just gotten married, those that have just... have. They just established, planted a field. Send them all home. Because their mind is going to be on that. So let them go and consecrate their land, consecrate their marriage, do all that, and then we'll bring them back into battle. Okay? That's exactly what happened when he got down to the 300. The fearful went home. Those that put their face in the water were sent home. Those that kneeled, brought it up to their mouth, were kept. Why? Because the one that kneeled and got up to, and, and brought it to their mouth were focusing on what the enemy was about ready to do at the watering hole. The other ones were just thirsty, so they stuck their face in. They weren't afraid. They're just preoccupied with themselves. So God sent them home. That leaves 300. So Gideon, with 300 men, he's not arguing with God, by the way. He's not like, hey, I can't do this with 300 men. It didn't matter. I think he came to the point where God can't do it with me either, so here we go. Like, it, he's whole. He met peace. Peace is a part of him. He's whole. But even in the midst of that, God is so good. He's such a good father because he knows, I'm going to take you into arenas that you're not quite familiar with, and it's going to make you afraid. But I'm still with you. So I'll help keep unpacking peace as we go. So they are surrounded. So now this is chapter 7 and verse 13. And God said to him just prior that I'm going to tell you something if you're afraid, Gideon, to strengthen you. Isn't it amazing that when you hear words that empower you, what happens? Like right now, if I said, if you, if you guys all open an envelope I sent you that came from your bank that says we're taking your home, we're taking your car, we're taking your salaries... And we're taking your wife and kids. Now, for those men that have struggled with that, that's a whole different thing. It, it would, and you knew it was from a valid source. It would cause you to... <sighs> correct? But all of a sudden, if you open up an envelope and there's a check for a million dollars with no strings attached, you'd be like, oh my goodness, let's have a party. I think we have need to... We can actually go an extra hour for service this morning. 
right? Because different news changes our heart. That's how we're designed. Everything flows from inside of you. When words come in, you process them and it changes you. It causes you to be different. And when Gideon had come, so God takes him down and he overlooks the, the, Philip, the Midianites and they were like swarms of locusts. So imagine you got 300 guys and you peek over the valley and you're like, and then God says, go down by the tent. So he sneaks down by a tent. And so it was when Gideon heard, it says in verse uh, 13, when Gideon had come, there's a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. I, I know this seems really strange. I, it took me a long time pondering this to see what, why a loaf of bread. And it came to a tent and struck it so that so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, I, I, I love how even the enemy has perceiving moments. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. First of all, I'm not sure how you got a loaf of barley bread bigger than a tent is the sword of Gideon and God is with him. Let me tell you why. Uh, a couple things in the dream I, I want to explain first before I tell you the punchline. In the dream, it's the sword of Gideon and Gideon, a man of Israel. This is very significant. The word Israel means to struggle with God and prevail. Brian, what are you saying? We're supposed to struggle with God? Gideon had a struggle with his thoughts that he once had before he met peace. The struggle is not a problem if you'll keep yourself in the struggle. There is things that we, we go and see a promise and all the thoughts swore, swarm in. God, if this is true, why this? If God, if this is true, why that? Stay there and let God rust. You're rustling with God because what you're rustling with is the truth of the word that he spoke. Gideon prevailed. Man of Israel, no longer a man of Jacob. No longer the trickster, not, you know, Jacob's name, trickster, but now the man of Israel. Second thing I want you to really catch on this, barley loaf. What was Gideon doing behind the wine press? Getting barley. What for? Try to eke out some kind of livelihood, some kind of substance for the sake of his family and his servants, Right? Then he takes that and gives it as a sacrifice. Because he doesn't want to be identified with, I just got to barely make it. I, I don't care what area of life this is. Whatever causes you to believe you're just barely getting there, something has to be broken. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what you offer. I'm not even saying, it's, I'm not referring to monetary things. I'm talking about the principle of the idea has to be offered and torn down. God saw him as a mighty valiant man that would deliver Israel. The enemy saw him as the embodiment of everything they robbed that would destroy him. He was whole, complete. He didn't need just a little barley and a little goat's milk and a little oil to try to put something together. He was complete. He needed nothing. He was what the enemy had tried to rob. And it broke the back of the enemy. Okay. Let's summarize. You guys okay? You catch where I'm going? 
wholeness, grace, and peace be multiplied to you. Do you see the power? This is a man that walked in a covenant blessing that was not even close to what we have now. Not even comparable. The Spirit of God didn't live in Gideon. The Spirit of God, the temple of God wasn't placed in Gideon's heart. He had to actually work yes and no questions to get an answer from a priest, a fleece, or anything. God doesn't talk to us in yes and no. He declares this is what you are. He talks to you. He interacts with you. He is doing those things. Gideon is the first one that met the relationship of conversation and allowed God to change his mind, and he walked in it, and he destroyed everything that caused him not to believe what he was. That's why Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Because it wants that because you can't walk away in your grace and you can't walk in your peace, in your wholeness, in your completeness with the favor of God on you. And if the enemy can stop that, he can stop you. Amen. See, the enemy could not stop Peter. We look at it and say, oh man, he's going to be killed. <laughs> he's changing our life today can stop them. We've been partakers of that. And Peter closes the book. He says, you therefore, beloved. That's you again. This is chapter 3 and verse 17. You therefore, beloved of 2 Peter. Since you know this beforehand, I'm warning you, the enemy's going to come and do everything to get you to think you need something. A little bit more. Maybe if I had this. Maybe if I had that special doodad. I know. This weight loss plan will work. It only cost me $800 a month, but I heard. I saw a YouTube testimony. If I had that, that then it would work. I don't need, you don't need that. It's called self-control. And it's a gift. It is a fruit of the Spirit. Self-control is a fruit of being whole. It is a fruit of walking in his favor and grace. And then he'll give you wisdom and understanding what to do with you to deal with it. That's powerful. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away by the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace, favor, and knowledge, intimate interaction, like better, but like Gideon did when he met and he interacted with God himself. Of our Lord Jesus Christ, to him be glory now and forever. Amen. This is what God has for us. And this morning, in that, the biggest heart that I had is your problem the things you face is not the mountain. And I'm for the verse, but there's context to it, of say to this mountain, be thou removed. But the person who could say to this mountain, be thou removed, is the person that is bigger than the mountain. Wholeness and grace makes us bigger than the mountain that we face. Now we're empowered. Now we're complete. How do I get that? The more I know him, the more I act on what he said, the more I'm deliberate about casting down the thoughts that are saying this isn't true, something starts stirring on the inside of me, and what you need is already there. And I didn't say easy. I didn't say this is the way it goes, but my son decided to lift weights, and I decided... Well, I got to be a good dad. I can't let him beat me. <laughs> it was hard. I found parts of me that didn't work right. <laughs> and they hurt. But we kept going. It wasn't to hurt, but now it's like I'm so, I'm so thankful. The thing that's, you know, your parents say this all the time, the thing that's good for you doesn't feel good now. But it's so true. 
because you're dying to an old way. It doesn't feel good to tear down old thoughts. It doesn't feel good to tear down beliefs that you've lived your whole life believing. It doesn't feel good doing that. But we're not about, even from our founding fathers, just in the natural, who believed most of them were deists and they weren't necessarily believing in Jesus Christ, what he provided for us, they even knew, be good. Don't seek good. Be it. Don't look to feel. 19, okay, I promise this is the last thing. Are you guys okay? I know you're hungry. Don't worry, my, if I go too long, my wife will tell me. Because she loves me. In E.W. Kenyon, I went and grabbed this little book that you have on the back little bookstore. You don't realize you have treasures hidden all over this place. Now, this is a guy writing about God, but he does walk through a pretty good manual of how to walk these things out. He was born one year after the end of the Civil War, and he died in 1948. He is really one of the founding fathers of how we understand two types of righteousness, the hidden man of the heart, Many of the principle of our words and life, he influenced. So he went through two world wars, the Great Depression, the boom, all of it. And his principles never changed because the word never changes. And he tells this little story. So I, I recommend reading this, but he says this. I picked this up. I just pulled it off your shelf and flipped it open. Thought I wonder what E-Dub had to say. He said, the hardest problem that faces our government is to deal with nations or ourselves that have worshipped a lie. They have no truth in them, and when they lie, they reflect part of themselves, for they are liars. And we're not listening to a lie. Any voice that comes and says, you're missing something is a lie. It's a lie. Any voice that comes to you and says, yeah, but because of this, I don't know. It's a lie. Any voice that says, you're incomplete. It's a lie. Any voice that wants to highlight your circumstances to cause you to step back, to, to intimidate, it's a lie. And I don't want to focus on our national government. I want to focus on our internal government. We need to start ruling our hearts in the manner that Peter was saying so we could stand firm at the end saying, and Jesus looks at us and says, well done. I'm not trying to get awards from him. I don't have to do extra works. I just need to know him. Take what he says. Believe in my peace. Believe in his grace. And walk it out. I recommend doing this. So the final story that he has for us, and then I'm going to do something special, is there's a man that he was, didn't really leave much for his kids, but he had a farm. And there's 10 acres on it. And there's all these stumps on the thing because he never really took care of it. And his kids, he passes away, and his kids, his last words, the stumps. So his kids, strange from their father, thought, well, man, there's probably gold out on one of those stumps. So over time, they cleared all 10 acres of all the stumps. Couldn't find any gold. Well, we cleared the field. We might as well plant something. So they plant corn. When harvest came, they looked out, and they realized the gold that the father left him was always sitting right in front of them. It was the harvest of the grain. There's things that many of you have battled that you thought, what now? And God wants to step back. You thought there was gold, physical. God had a different kind of gold. It, it, it pays the same. It changes our expectations. So I'm going to have you guys stand for a moment. I, I, I'm so, I, this is, I've never been, I feel like a spout, and I, I think there's still water in there. But I, I won't. 
Because we got I guess we got to eat. I'm going to ask this a little bit special because if we're going to get back to virtue, Peter uses a couple words. So if you'll just trust in the grace, and if, you, if this bothers someone, talk to Steve. <laughs> he, he loves handling this kind of thing. In order to get back to a place of virtue, and I'm not saying let's go back and restart. I'm just talking about if to, to kind of clear the slate, to kind of clear the field of stumps. And we talk about fatherless. If you notice that pure religion has nothing to do with taking care of men. None. Not even mentioned. Yet our culture today has so berated, effeminized, destroyed, castrated, weakened, and just validated the insecurity already that was in you from the fall, it, sometimes it just feels like it doesn't really matter what I do. It's still not going to be enough. So what I would like, now ladies, I promise you, if one guy in our program gets saved, we always get a whole handful of ladies. It's not that you're not important because you're extremely important. And it's not that your role is, is less because it is not true. But if we don't establish the pillars, and I'm not talking about who gets to speak on Sunday morning, okay? I'm talking about just the core foundation of the validation of godly men it will change the atmosphere in here because ladies, whether you have a husband, whether you come from a bad marriage, whether you come from a horrible situation, when there's strong men in the church, there's freedom for you to be and grow in what you are created to be. It's a truth. I, you can be mad at me for saying it. It is just true. Men have their own issues that they get to, the weight they get to carry. So I'm going to ask you this, men, if you have struggled with any area where you just don't feel like you know how to be the man of God, and I'm saying how to be, like you don't even know how to see it. God, what does that look like? I would like you, now if you, if you got it, don't come up. But if, if you need, I want you to all come up here, all the men. You can just stand across and, I guess, stare at me. And while we're doing this, could someone go and get Jess and bring her up here? Okay. All right. Gunner, where are you? Get over here. David, come here. Steve? Okay, you're not getting out of this one. Can you stand here? And you guys, what I want you to do is come on each side, and you're going to do this. Yeah. All right, now listen. The word talks about brotherly kindness. There's a reason Peter uses that term. Brother kindly kindness is a fraternal love. It's different than agape, but he, we get there. The fraternal love is the guy on your left and the guy on your right has to stand as a bulwark. And your job is to make sure they do. You lock arms. When the one person can't, go ahead and lock arms. You guys okay? All right. When you're locked arms and someone starts wobbling, what happens? Y'all go. I won't always like things. Like, I don't like the color purple. Not my favorite. <laughs> but I'm not quit over dumb things. And I bring him up there, and I brought my son up here, and I bring Gunner because I've seen something in them. And one day they'll pass it on. I'll stand with Steve. He has modeled 
what virtue looks like. He, he's modeled these things. Not perfect. He's getting there. Almost like me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he modeled it. He stood with us. He stands with people that he shouldn't be standing with. He doesn't care. He's locked. Sometimes he has to stand alone. And when you guys know what it's like to have someone, you guys will start creeping in. It's not about giving more words. It's not about giving more encouragement. It's about standing. I'm not moving. I'll go with you. Because this church is going somewhere. Amen. And if you don't think that it's going somewhere, you're in the wrong place. So stick around for a little bit. It's going somewhere. And it can't go anywhere. It's not about who's the minister or who's the speaker. It can't go without the man of the church. 90% of kids will go to church when the father wants to go to church. 40% of the kids will go to church if it's just the mother who wants to go to church. I'm telling you, there's an influence here that we've missed, and God wants to do something great in you. Your ministry is so powerful. Without you, the harbor does not, is overwhelmed by the waves. But one person can't do it, but all of us can. This is important. We train up our sons. I don't do it all right. Just ask. I'll fight for him. And I know my son will fight for me. I know Gunner will fight for his dad. Something has been stilled enough to know we've got to have this. Love. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have you disconnect your arms to make this easier. You guys stay. You're not going. Turn around. I want you to face everybody. Now, and I'm going to have you do this again because you like being told what to do. I'm, I'm joking. Put your arms, relock your arms. That's your why. That's your why. Amen. Because there's so much value in this room. And you have all these gems, but there's no socket to mount the gem into. That's your why. And I will tell you, when people start seeing what takes place in this room because of the bulwark that protects this church, something powerfully is going to change. So here's what we're going to do. While we're standing here, guys, I'm going to pray over you. And then I just want you to repeat with me kind of a decree. Because I'm telling you, you guys don't even know when you stand strong, it's not just affecting your own family. It's affecting other people that are desiring. I wished I had someone strong to stand with. But they can just look at this mass, and it's not just one person or this person. They can go to any, and you guys keep locked arms to keep saving and to interacting so we can keep building the heart of this. Because we are going to look like an ugly bunch if they don't get their fulfillment of what they're called to. All right? Father, I'm just going to pray over these men, and then we're just going to decree a decree. And Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to stand. We thank you that your, your truths are not just spiritual, they're physical, they're natural, they're mental, they're, all of it is part of what we are. And Father, I declare over these men a, a, a place of renouncement of tearing down the beliefs that said they weren't capable so they choose to sit down rather than stand up like a man, which is what the word brave actually means. And Father, as they stand here, I speak your grace, your wholeness, and your completeness over them. Now, if you guys will just say with me, you can open your eyes. I declare, I, declare, I am complete in Christ. I am complete in Christ. I am whole in Christ. I am whole in Christ. I am fulfilled in Christ. I am fulfilled in Christ. My value comes from God alone. My value comes from God alone. And I choose. Now don't say this if you don't mean it. I choose. I choose to offer myself. To offer myself on behalf of everyone else. On behalf of everyone else. And to be strong for them. And to be strong for them. Just like our founding fathers. Just like our a strong government, a strong government is a strong self-governed people. Is a strong self-governed people. And I am that in Jesus. And I am that in Jesus. Sorry, let's try it again. And I am that. And I am that 
In Jesus. In Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay, men, you can go stand. Uh, take a seat. And one more, one more thing. Uh, while you guys are sitting, um, Valerie, you can go sit. Oh. Would you come up here real quick so I can give the beauty to the LeBron? Jess? And men, actually, men, go ahead and just stay there. You guys are going to pray with me. We can face this way. Jess, will you come up here? Will you share? Will you? During, during praise and worship, um, Jess, the Lord highlighted her to me. And it was a beautiful picture of Jesus. Like she was um, on a stage in the bright lights. And it was like she was um, crowned. And Jesus was crowning the, a crown of loving kindness, and it was filled with sparkling, radiant gems. And he was just radiating his love on you, like you were the winner. <laughs> and you were just receiving and, and enveloped in the love of Christ. And he was just crowning you with, as the winner, <laughs> as the champion with radiant mm -hmm. gems. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so all of us here, I want you guys to see how we honor. We all are in agreement, and we're here to protect what you have. You be you. You feel freedom to be you. You be everything God created, but you have this when the waves come. Not just your husband, which is very important, but all of it. That's how we need to treat our family. Amen. Please receive the blessing that the Father has for you. He calls you beloved, the ones that are greatly loved. And we, he and I both desire that you experience prosperity and his type of divine health. And the way this happens is by allowing your soul to prosper through intimacy with him and knowledge of his word. I love you and I'll see you again soon.